Hello, grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to a brand new unit. We have chapter four here, memory and motivation. Let's get into the first lesson. Processes of memory, part one, as you can see here and here. So we have some key points on the top right. I encourage you to check those out. Uh, okay, so key point one is encoding. So encoding is transforming uh, the sensory information that we talked about in unit 2.5 uh, into something that can be stored within the brain. So not only do you need to sense it and perceive it, but how do you transform it into something that can be stored inside your brain? Um, so there are a couple of different um, ways that we encode things. Like if you use your uh, hearing to do that, that would be an acoustic code. Um, when you try to say something several times out loud to yourself, um, like a phone number uh, or someone's order at Subway, then that's you like using your hearing to try to encode that into your brain. Sometimes you try to keep a mental picture of something. If you're using a visual code, you look at something uh, really closely and then you picture that uh, in your head, um, maybe in a puzzle or something like that, maybe a 3D puzzle for example, and then there's semantic encoding, um, which involves like a, almost like a trick or it, it, it connects it to something that's important to you. So if you're learning something that's important to you, uh, you're automatically doing semantic encoding. It has specific meaning, a reason that you're doing it. Uh, but something like bed mass, uh, brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction, that has meaning. And I have encoded that into my brain to mean those things. After you encode it, you need to do key point two, which is store it. Uh, so after information is encoded, it goes to storage. Storage is the process by which information is maintained in your brain over time. The amount of information one can store depends on the effort that was put into it, uh, the encoding and its importance. So uh, if you are trying to remember something, you can only remember as much as you noticed. Um, it, you know, as much uh, of the senses that you are attentive to, uh, that's how much you'll be able to remember accurately. You may remember flashes of things, um, but you need to pay attention to stuff to remember it. Um, and information can be stored for just seconds or for years. Uh, depends on what type of memory we're talking about. So sensory information, short-term uh, sensory memory and short-term memory we're gonna talk about in this lesson but long-term is in lesson two. After you encode it and you store it, uh, the really useful thing is to retrieve it. So retrieval uh, includes recall and recognition, just like taking things out of your brain or recon some, recognizing someone's face, recognizing your doggo, things like that. Uh, memory retrieval is the process of remembering information that's stored in your long-term memory. Um, the ease at which this information can be retrieved depends on how efficiently you encoded and stored it. So if it's something that uh, was very efficiently encoded and stored in your brain, maybe something that you use a lot, uh, then that information is easy to retrieve. You can probably very easily picture the faces of your brothers and sisters or of your friends um, because that information is encoded every single day uh, and then stored in your brain. Um, so re retrieval depends on how well you encoded it and stored it in the first place. Uh, interesting, the tip of the tongue phenomenon occurs when an individual can almost recall a word, but cannot quite identify it. It's almost like you have it in your brain, but you can't translate it into speech. You know what the answer is, but you can't say it out loud. Um, it's speaking it out loud or writing it down on paper Putting it into words is definitely uh, an extra part of retrieval. So we have three processes of memory, and you've probably been wondering since the title, what are the processes of memory? So there's sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Uh, we're going to focus on short sensory and short-term today. So once the senses encode a memory into the brain, um, you must hold on to it, uh, on, in, onto that input and store it for future reference. The first step here is your sensory memory. In your sensory memory, 
The senses of sight, hearing, and touch are able to hold an input just for a fraction of a second before it disappears. So um, you, your, your senses remember that there's a computer in front of you so that it's not um, a shock, a surprise every time. Like, oh, there's a computer in front of me. Oh, there's a computer in front of me. No, like your senses know that and like your senses are not shocked by it every single time. You're not bombarded by these senses because your senses remember it. Um, so information that you pay attention to gets stored into the short-term memory. Essentially, the things that you're doing at the time, the thing that you're reading at the time, gets stored into short-term memory, which can be like 10 to 20 seconds. So the sensory memory essentially prevents your senses from being overwhelmed, um, st stops it from being bombarded all the time. Every single day, you're bombarded with nonstop stimuli from your senses. You would have to pay attention to all of them. It would overwhelm you. Um, it would be terrible. You would always feel the clothes on you. It would be no good at all. So uh, sensory memory prevents you from being overwhelmed. Uh, it gives you time to make a decision. So the information stays in your sensory memory long enough just for you to make a reaction, maybe reaction time, um, if something's coming at your face, or just long enough for you to decide whether it's worth paying attention to. Uh, this kind of explains reflexes when you think about it. If something's coming at you and you flinch before you even really realize that something's coming at you, uh, that's your sensory memory um, working before your short-term memory is working. Uh, and the third part of sensory memory is that it allows for continuity and stability in your world when you're walking around, you know, not everything is new to your senses. Information is stored for a split second, so then we have time to perceive it. We have time to uh, pay attention to it if we want to, and then make sense of it. So short-term memory. Um, is the things that you have in your conscious mind at any one moment. Uh, what are you thinking about right now? And what you, have you been thinking about for the past 10 seconds? That will be held in your short-term memory. Short-term memory does not necessarily involve paying close attention to something, but uh, what do you have in your conscious mind? So the example that's given and the point uh, there is when you're listening to someone, uh, but you're not really listening to someone, you know, they're talking, but you're on your phone and you're scrolling, you're on Instagram and uh, they're talking and talking and talking and then they accuse you of not paying attention, but you go, no, 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 I'm paying attention and you repeat the last sentence, the last two sentences that they said and you prove that you're innocent. You really weren't paying attention, but uh, you kind of look like you are and that's because what is in your conscious mind is in your short-term memory. You can spit out that last sentence or two to them because they just said it to you so recently and that's what you're uh, consciously doing at the time. You're scrolling uh, and being bombarded with these words. So you can do this because you're holding on to the words in your short-term memory. Uh, a couple ways to improve your short-term memory is maintenance rehearsal. Say that thing to yourself over and over again. To keep information in short-term memory for more than a few seconds, you usually have to repeat the information to yourself or out loud, and that's called maintenance rehearsal. Say the phone number, say the subway order. Uh, that keeps it in your brain, that keeps it in your consciousness, and helps you with your short-term memory. When you look up a phone number, for example, you can remember the seven digits long enough to dial them if you repeat it several times. Sometimes I ask someone else to remember these numbers, and then I just ask them for it after I've typed the first three. Um, it just makes it easier to remember the whole thing. Because short-term memory only lasts about 20 seconds without any kind of rehearsal. So it's way too short for you to remember things if you need to like someone tell you and then you hang up the phone and then you need to like get yourself together and then dial the phone again. I would never remember the phone number. I always need to write it down or say it to myself a bunch of times. Another trick for memory is chunking. So short-term memory is not only limited in its duration, 20 seconds, but also its capacity. Uh, there is a limit of about seven unrelated items 
that your brain can hold in order. Uh, sometimes it can be more and sometimes it can be less, but that's why it says about seven unrelated items. So for example, someone reels off a series of numbers to you, you'll be able to keep about seven or eight of them in your immediate memory. But beyond that, the confusion about the numbers will set in. If you think about it, that's why we chunk up um, our phone numbers into three parts. Um, so one of the tricks to memorizing is to chunk the information. And if you look at the phone numbers here, uh, we can break it up into you know, this part here and this part here or this part, this part, and this part instead of seven separate parts. Uh, if we chunk the items together, um, it's easier to remember them. If we connect them in groups, we have fewer to remember. If we example, For example, if we remember a new phone number in two or three chunks, rather than a seven digit uh, string of seven digits, it's much easier for us to remember. We can even add the area code on in front of it, 204, and it's not as big a deal to remember. This also works when grouping figures. So if you look at the left figure here, you're probably, you know how many there are, but it, you're not completely sure. With this one, if you glance at it, oh, you're way more sure about how many there are because there's three groups of three, which is nine. And this is what chunking does, even with visual representations. With this one, break it up here, here, and here, I guess. But this one is much easier to see that there are three groups of three for a total of nine. So chunking is automatic and it's very, very useful for our brains and um, the reason that we break up phone numbers and other numbers uh, into um, chunks to remember them. You have some important terms to check out and your short-term memory assignment. So if you have questions, please let me know. But thanks so much for watching everyone. And I'll see you soon.